I would like to say thank you and also introduce this fantastic slate of speakers. We're going to start off with uh, Rachel Karchin uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Rachel has been an expert in variant annotation for a very long time. Uh, then we'll move over to uh, Sheilin Lee uh, from Indiana University, uh, who's worked extensively with Top Med um, and works on the, the star um, annotator and really tool set. Um, then uh, we'll move over to uh, Xiao from uh, Harvard. I actually got to meet him in person at Harvard last week, which was great. Um, and uh, he'll uh, speak a little bit uh, about STAR as well. Uh, and then I'll wrap up and I'll talk about really how to deploy uh, the annotators they talk about on the UKB wrap, really reinforce those concepts. Um, and they're going to show you some really uh, complex uh fantastic sort of modern annotation techniques. Also talk a little bit about sort of how to do very basic annotation on the UKB wrap as you ramp up uh, to get uh, sort of where you need to be uh, to use their annotation platform. So, um, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. I think we're at a place now uh, in genomics where we really should be thinking about combinations of annotators, thinking about molecular annotators, population-based annotators, and clinical annotators. And I, that's what I believe these platforms allow you to do. So that's exciting. But before we get to Rachel, uh, I'd just like to introduce you uh, in case you're just getting started with the RAP or you're just working on your UKB application or you're a bioinformatician that works on something sort of uh, adjacent uh, to the UK Biobank, but you're still really interested in what people are doing, check out community.dnanexus.com. Uh, it's basically BioStars for the UKB wrap. Thanks to Ishvan Albert, who runs BioStars, for helping us set this up. Uh, and you can check out, uh, you can find out about webinars like this, all kinds of other things. Uh, so, so really just a phenomenal resource. It's something I'm really proud to be uh, involved in. And, and thanks to Chai, uh, who runs that uh, resource. Uh, also, uh, for grad students, for folks from developing countries, uh, there are uh, AWS credits that you can use uh, in order to analyze UK Biobank data on the RAP. So uh, check this out. Um, you can Google for AWS credits, UK Biobank. Uh, you should be able to find it. It's very easy to apply. Uh, I highly encourage folks to apply. Also, uh, if you're a grad student, your lab doesn't have a UKB application, you can get uh, a UKB uh, application uh, as a specific grad student. So uh, that's exciting as well. Finally, uh, we have accelerator packages. If you're from a large company, you need to get spun up on the wrap very quickly. Uh, jump into things, so on and so forth. You want really sort of supported bioinformatics, uh, other types of support, an accelerator package might be for you. Click on this link, scan this QR code, you can get to this, or just find me, uh, send, send me a note, and uh, we'll, get you, uh, we'll get you set up with one of these accelerator packages or other services. So um, if that's what you need, uh, just let us know. That's great. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Rachel Karchin, uh, who is going to talk about uh, variant annotation in general, uh, really getting everybody sort of up to speed and level set, and then really talk about uh, the open cravat package developed at Johns Hopkins University for really flexible variant annotation. So without further ado, uh, here's Rachel Karchin. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, ben, thanks for inviting me to come. So as Ben said, I'm going to talk about variant annotation. And let's get started here. All right. So what is variant annotation and why should we do it? So it's known that while most variants are completely neutral and don't have any impact on human health or evolutionary fitness, there are, in fact, some variants that are known to cause disease. There are also common variants that are known to be associated with uh, many phenotypes, just general human phenotypes, 
such as height, lactose intolerance, and this kind of thing. Um, most variants are not that well understood. So the impact of these variants uh, is something that we would like to figure out. And to do this, uh, we do what's called variant annotation, which is finding different types of information that we can associate with a particular variant. And I would like to say that the variant annotation field has been going on for about 20 years, and it was developed kind of in parallel to the whole GWAS framework. So for GWAS studies, um, you have typically a case and a control population, and you look for common variants where there is a statistical signal that shows you that the variant is associated with the phenotype that you're studying. But uh, for many variants, uh, most variants in fact are rare, and there just is not enough power to find a statistical association of, between the variant and a phenotype. So the idea of variant annotation is that regardless of whether you have uh, case or control cohorts to do analysis, you can still find out a lot about a variant that you're interested in. And depending on the questions that your study is designed to answer, you may be interested in different types of information, uh, which is why we want variant annotation to be as flexible as possible. And this uh, funnel figure uh, gives you the general idea of what we'd like to do. Uh, you have a large study. It might just be one individual for which you've done whole genome sequencing and found millions of variants. Or you may have a study with thousands or even hundreds of thousands of individuals. And then you're gonna just have a huge number of variants to analyze. It seems like it's intractable, but using fast modern variant annotation tools, you should be able to work your way through this funnel and come up with a tractable list of the most interesting variants to you for the purposes of your study. The most basic annotation uh, starting, so typically uh, variants are reported in terms of genomic coordinates. So the first four columns that you see on this slide are typically what you would get back from a sequencing study. So you get the chromosome and the genomic address you have a reference base and an alt base, but that doesn't really tell you very much. So the first step is typically to map from the genome first onto the transcriptome. And because of alternative splicing, it's possible that, uh, and in fact, very likely that a variant at a single genomic position maps onto multiple transcripts. And it may have different effects depending on the transcript that you map it to. Uh, then there is a cDNA change, uh, mapping to uh, perhaps the variant occurs in a gene. You might be interested in the sequence ontology, whether the variant causes a change in the protein sequence, whether it's intronic, whether it's missense, or causes a premature stop codon. So uh, you might also be interested in the specific protein change. So this is the most basic level of variant annotation. It's something that is provided in Open Cravat, the package I'm gonna tell you about, and of course, in most other variant annotation packages. But you don't wanna just stop here. Um, there are many things you might wanna know about variants. And I've broken this down into some different categories of properties. Uh, that people often look at to try to learn about the importance of a variant. So uh, there is uh, disease relevance, allele frequency, evolutionary conservation, uh, experimental data. There are computational predictions, impact on regulatory elements, most of which are non-coding. And for coding variants, it may be possible to figure out uh, the impact of the variant on protein structure. So I'm gonna go through each of these categories and tell you about some databases that contain information uh, from these categories. And just as a preview to what I'm gonna say about Open Cravat, you can access all of these databases through Open Cravat. So you can get all these annotations in one place 
if you use a package like Open Cravat. So there are a number of databases that uh, describe variants that are known to be important for health. Uh, for example, ClinVar uh, from the uh, US NCBI uh, is a uh, large database of variants uh, originally developed to associate variants with Mendelian disease, but they've since gone broader and also now look at somatic variants. Uh, there is PharmGKB, which is a database of variants that have pharmacogenomic effects, so that may influence sensitivity or resistance to common drugs. And um, there's also databases such as the GWAS catalog that can tell you uh, for common variants, which ones are, have already been statistically associated with disease. And there are thousands of GWAS studies that have been performed uh, over the past 20 years, which are summarized in a database such as GWAS catalog. Next, we have allele frequency. So allele frequency uh, is uh, computed typically uh, from large populations of individuals, and it can be used primarily to identify benign or neutral mutations. Uh, the reasoning is that uh, most mutations that are very common have not been evolutionarily selected against uh, across uh, vertebrate and human evolution or even farther back. So if you can identify a variant that is found in a large number of individuals, there's really a good chance that variant is benign. And of course, uh, this differs from population to population. So databases such as NOMAD and Thousand Genomes uh, include thousands of participants, and the allele frequencies are defined for particular global populations, uh, since again, these frequencies differ across populations. Evolutionary conservation is another very interesting property. Of course, uh, humans and closely related organisms have very similar DNA, and often we can compare human DNA or protein sequence to identify important differences. Uh, this is uh, uh, kind of a related idea to the idea that a, a variant that is common among human populations is probably benign. Again, a variant uh, that uh, is uh, very similar across uh, different species, particularly closely related species, is likely to be benign. And there are a large number of mathematical and computational models that have been developed to quantify uh, the amount of constraint at a particular site. Uh, the idea being that if a site is particularly constrained, uh, you do not want to see a variant at that site uh, because it's probably important for normal functioning. If you see similar variation at that site, uh, it's probably a benign variant. All right, here's another source of information about variants, which is experimental data. And uh, this is uh, an area that has just exploded over the past few years. Uh, there are uh, bench experiments that you can do. Uh, they traditionally were done in a single protein where you repeatedly induce a mutation uh, at every site in a protein sequence. For example, you may try to uh, put in different amino acid substitutions at that site, or maybe even do a deletion at that site, and then do a functional assay to see if the function of the protein is affected. And of course, if the function of the protein is affected by that substitution, uh, it's quite likely that that variant uh, might be functionally important and might be associated with disease. That is, if the protein is important in a pathway relevant to that disease. And recently, uh, these types of experiments have become multiplexed and high throughput. Uh, there are now resources such as the MAVEDB uh, in which re uh, researchers have very, very systematically gone through many proteins uh, with this type of what's called saturation mutagenesis and done high throughput experiments to see changes in protein function. 
So uh, this type of data is very interesting. Uh, another type of data that uh, is often quite relevant to non-coding variants, which don't have direct implications for changes in proteins, is whether a variant occurs in an important regulatory element, such as an enhancer, a repressor site, a hypersensitive site, and so forth. So uh, annotators that tell you where these important regulatory elements are in the human genome uh, may be useful uh, in showing you whether a non-coding variant has functional importance. Uh, here is a, a very useful, and uh, this is a type of annotation uh, that is quite computationally intensive to compute. Uh, but if a protein makes uh, is changed, uh, if its coding sequence is changed by a variant, uh, it may be that uh, this variant is going to cause changes in the structure of the protein. So the protein might be destabilized, it might no longer function. And there are a number of predictors that have quantified uh, which uh, amino acid changes might damage the protein function for reasons related to uh, protein structure. The last type of annotator I'm going to describe is uh, very general. It's computational prediction. So uh, even with all the types of information I've told you about so far, uh, it's not possible to uh, make decisions about the importance of every variant in the human genome. Certainly not possible to do experiments. Um, there are, it's not always possible to do good sequence alignments for a variant. Uh, so people have developed many computational tools uh, to help predict which variants are most likely to be related to disease. And uh, this is a very popular field. There are literally hundreds of computational prediction methods out there. This is sometimes considered a controversial area of research uh, because it's unclear which of these prediction methods are the best, or in fact, whether any of them work. And in fact, uh, the community of people who work on this uh, have organized themselves into an experiment called the Critical Assessment of Genome Interpretation. This was based on uh, 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 a CASP, which you may have heard of, which was the Critical Assessment of uh, Structural Protein Prediction, Structural Prediction. And it has a, a similar structure to, to the CASP experiment. So uh, the idea is that uh, a challenge is presented to the community. So for CASP, it was to predict a protein structure for sequence. For KG, it's to make a prediction about either a particular variant or uh, for a full exome or genome sequence of an individual. And then uh, it's, you, you need a truth set. So for both these experiments, it's the true answer is known, but it hasn't been published yet. So it's hidden from the community. And then there's a, a season, a prediction season, in which different teams uh, uh, submit predictions from their computational methods. And uh, at the end of the season, a team of assessors compares the predictions to what is the truth, what is known. So this is very nice. Uh, typically, if you go to the literature and read someone's paper about their method, uh, their method will be the best method in the world when you read the paper. This is just necessary because to publish a paper, you have to convince the editors of the journal that your method is the best method. But clearly, there's always bias when the creator of a method assesses their own method. So experiments like KG, there are other experiments, uh, such as the DREAM competition, that are similar. Uh, these experiments are a lot more objective because uh, they are truly unbiased the way they're designed. Um, so uh, something like KG can help you assess uh, which methods are best. Although, um, in, for full disclosure, my observation has been that it's quite important who actually uses a method not just the method itself. So sometimes in particular hands, a method can do fantastic in a KG challenge, whereas in other hands, it doesn't do so well. 
And here on this slide, I just have some examples of challenges that have been introduced in KG. Uh, this has been going on for about 12 years. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, I encourage you to go to this URL. Next, I'm going to tell you about Open Cravat, which is a meta uh, annotator for variants, uh, which uh, I am uh, the, the lead uh, PI, the lead scientist on this project. And uh, this project began as a way to uh, promote methods that had been developed in my own lab. But uh, on popular demand, we uh, increased the number of annotation sources to now over 150. I think the number is even larger than this. And we now incorporate methods from labs all over the world. Uh, the idea is that the annotations can be used very flexibly. So uh, we have a store of annotators. You can flexibly decide the annotators that are relevant to your scientific questions and apply those to the variants in your study. And rather than having to run all these many computational predictors or go to all these different uh, databases using Open Cravat, uh, you can find them all in one place. And it's quite easy to use. It's very, very fast. It handles a very large number of variants. Uh, it's an open source project. Uh, you can see our code on Open Cravat. We have specifically code to build the DNA Nexus app for Open Cravat. Uh, and all the data in our store is uh, on the AWS uh, Open Data project here at this address. Well, here is a slide showing just a selection of the many types of annotators we have available. Again, uh, these include computational predictors, measures of evolutionary conservation, disease databases, um, uh, experimental uh, functional annotation databases. We have annotation, we have annotations of genes as well as variants. We have databases of population allele frequencies. And again, you can just check the ones you want. So here is a slide from our website. Our tool is available uh, over uh, the web. You can also install it as a local package. But we advise, uh, if you want to use it for the UK Biobank, to use it on DNA Nexus. And here is just a snapshot of some of the many annotators that are, that are available. Um, in particular, here is a snapshot of some of the variant effect predictors, the computational predictors that are available. Uh, and these annotators are organized in different categories. So uh, you're not overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of possible annotations in the store. Uh, you can simply select on a category you're interested in and get a list of the annotators in that category. Uh, to use Open Cravat on DNA Nexus, uh, we have created a special, particularly fast implementation. Uh, and uh, it's simplified in that the input is going to be a VCF file. Uh, you then select your annotators, and the output is an annotated VCF file. Uh, you can see here a screenshot of what the uh, app looks like on DNA Nexus. Uh, you essentially select uh, the genome assembly you want to work with. Um, you select annotators. Uh, we have drop-down menus uh, that allow you to select the annotators. Um, we also here have a uh, just a simple package to help you get started. If you want to just uh, experiment and you're not sure which annotators you want to use, we have a list here, kind of a sampler of annotators from each category you can use. You can also start with this set of default annotators by clicking on True using this drop-down menu to select uh, six additional annotators. And finally, you can make a comma-delimited list uh, for, and you could therefore have as many annotators as you like uh, for your particular study. Uh, our thought is that often people just want to use a few annotators, and it can be confusing to have too many annotators applied to your variants. 
So you can control here the number of annotators you use. Um, in the README file on the app, we have a table with a description of what all the annotators are. Um, and if you go to our website here, uh, you can browse the store and get a more colorful and detailed description of each of these annotators. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. Um, we are really interested in adding more annotators to our store. So uh, please get in touch with us. Here's support, support at opencravat.org is the best way to reach us. Um, uh, many people uh, from uh, groups outside our team have added uh, different types of databases or variant effect predictors. Uh, and we're really interested in, in continuing to increase the number of annotators available in Open Cravat. Oh, and finally, thanks to our funders, uh, the uh, NIH, NCI, Informatics Technology for Cancer Research, and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rachel. That's great. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I'll, uh, I'll give Rachel uh, a chance to answer those. Uh, or in the q and I'll give Rachel a chance to answer those by text, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end uh, to um, uh, have an open discussion about variant annotation. Uh, that said, what I'd like to do first uh, is really talk uh, about or transition uh, to uh, another pipeline uh, that is also used for multiple variant annotation and another pipeline that I really consider to be sort of the modern way of doing variant annotation. I mean, for many years, uh, as Rachel mentioned, uh, we, we really used annotator by annotator. Uh, I think now we're, we're moving to these sort of platforms and pipelines uh, that will do multiple annotation uh, for us. And, and that's really the, the purpose of this webinar. Uh, so that said, I'd like to bring on uh, Jilin Lee and Jihao Lee um, from Indiana and Harvard, respectively, uh, to talk about uh, the STAR pipeline and the variant annotation functions within that pipeline. And again, thanks for being here. Thanks for your introduction, Ben. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm pleased to be here alongside with my uh, collaborator, uh, Dr. Si Hao Li, to introduce our proposed uh, STAR pipeline, an all-in-one revariant tool for bellback scale whole genome sequencing data incorporating a variant functional annotations. So our presentations include four parts. So first, uh, uh, first we will briefly introduce uh, the whole genome sequencing data and the statistical and computational challenges in analyzing this data, especially for the rare variant associated analysis. So next, uh, we will introduce our proposed STAR pipeline and all-in-one rare variant analysis tools for bellback scale whole genome sequencing data. And then in the third part, we will introduce the current implementations of the STAR pipeline in RAB. And finally, it is the conclusion session. So I will introduce the, uh, the first two parts and, uh, and see how we'll present the, uh, the last two parts. Uh, for every of us, each human genome contains three billion base pairs. So an important goal of human genetic research is to detect the genetic basis of human diseases or traits. So genome-wide association studies has been successfully detected thousands of common variants associated with human diseases or traits in the past 15 years. However, these variants only explain a small fraction of the heart abilities. The majority of the variants in the human genomes are rare variants. To study the effects of rare variants, a, a rapidly increasing number of whole genome sequencing studies uh, are being conducted uh, recently. Uh, for example, so the UK Bell Bank just uh, uh, recently released uh, the whole genome sequencing data of 200,000 individuals on RAP. So many of you might familiar with the uh, GVAS data, but uh, but might perhaps have limited experience of the whole genome sequencing data. So here we will use a top mat, uh, a phrase. We will use a top mat whole genome sequencing data to briefly introduce the 
data structures of the whole genome sequencing data. So there are uh, uh, there are about uh, 140,000 individuals in the top at phase eight data, and among these individuals, there are in total about uh, 700 million of the variants uh, in the genomes. And among the list variants, we found that only 1.8% of these variants are the common variants with a metal frequency larger than 1%, and the other remain at 8% are all rare variants with a metal frequency less than 1%. So another interesting observation is that so among these variants, about 60% of these variants are the singletons and doubletons. Here, for each of these singletons and the doubletons, only one or two of the individuals have the different alleles uh, compared to the others. So these observations indicate that so the genotype matrix of the whole genome sequencing data is very, is very, very sparse, which is really different uh, compared to the GWAS data. Then how could we analyze this, this huge data set? So the classical analysis strategies uh, in GVAS is to perform single variant analysis and then use a multiple testing adjustment to, to detect the, the significant ones. However, these strategies could not directly use uh, to the rare variant analysis due to the lack of power. So instead of testing each variant individually, a uh, variant set test has been proposed to evaluate the cumulative effects of the variants in a variant set. And when there are multiple variants in the variant set associated with the disease or the trait, then the variant set test could increase the powers. So then when we apply the variant set test to analyze the rare variants in the whole genome sequence studies, here are the challenges. So the first, uh, so the first one is just the selection of the rare variants in the variant set. Uh, uh, how could we define the, the, the analysis units of the rare variant to make the analysis powerful? And the second one is just about the choice of the variant set test. So in literature, uh, many variant set tests has been proposed. We need to find one uh, which works well for the whole genome sequencing data. And the third one is just about the leverage of the biological information, just as Rachel introduced. So now there are many functional annotations has been proposed, which could be predict that the, uh, the biological functionalities of the variant. Could we leverage these information to increase our analysis powers? And the last challenge is just about the computation scalabilities for analyzing uh, this huge data set. So to address uh, to address these challenges, we propose the the, uh, the star pipeline, uh, 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 a functionally informed the whole genome sequencing association analysis pipeline. So the researchers only need to bring their own phenotype and genotype data, and the star pipeline and the related tool sets will then ha will automatically handle all the. Uh, 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 all the remaining things for the uh, for the analysis, including the data preprocessing, uh, annotating the variants in the genomes, perform association analysis, and uh, and also last the analytical follow ups. So specifically, so first the uh, first uh, uh, some tool sets will uh, will perform the data pro uh, processing. It will calculate the the PCs and the GRMs, which could be used to control for the population stratifications and the readiness. And the, it will also to generate the GDS files. So here the GDS files uh, is uh, are are highly compressed the genotype files compared to the VSET files. And then in the second steps. Uh, some tool set uh, will uh, will will annotate the variants across the genomes. We will use the uh, favorite annotators uh, to annotate all the variants in your data set and generate the AGDS files. So here, the AGDS files is an extension of the GDS files, uh, uh, which uh, which which stores uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 genotype information alongside with the annotations. And then in the third steps, our star pipeline will automatically perform the Z association analysis. For common variants, our star pipeline uh, provides a single variant analysis like GVAS. For rare variant analysis, star pipeline uses a variant set analysis. So in star pipeline, we consider two different strategies to group the rare variants. First one is a gene-centric analysis, and the second one is a non-gene-centric analysis. For gene-centric analysis, we mainly focus on analyzing the variants in or near a genes, and we group the variants uh, uh, based on the biological functionalities. 
And uh, and uh, for the Nandrin centric analysis, we focus on analyzing the variants in the non coding regions, especially in the intergenic regions, and we group the variants uh, based on the uh, based on its positions. Then for each variant set, either defined in the gene centric analysis or in the non gene centric analysis, our star pipeline uses the star method to 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 incorporate multiple functional notations to further increase the analysis powers. Then in the last steps, our star pipeline uh, provide a. Uh, provide some tools uh, to do the analytical follow-ups, including the result summarizations and visualizations, and also do the conditional analysis. So in this slide, I will introduce uh, more details about the grouping strategies of real variants in STAR pipeline. So here we consider two strategies. One is gene-centric analysis, and the other one is non-gene-centric analysis. In gene-centric analysis, we focus on analyzing the variants in our neural genes, and we group the variants uh, based on the functional categories. We provide five coding masks, uh, for example, the loss of function variants, missense variants, or the synonymous variants. And also we provide eight non-coding masks for example, so the, so the promoters are the enhancers, but overlaid with the DHS set, and we also provide a mask uh, for the NCRA genes. And then the second part is a non-gene-centric analysis, where we focus on analyzing the variants in the non-coding genomes. And here we provide two different strategies. The first one is a fixed side cellular window analysis, and the second one is a data-adaptive size dynamic window analysis. For the selling window analysis, the user could specify the, uh, the, uh, the lens they want to use in the analysis. For example, in our analysis, we will use the 2KB selling window procedures with 1KB CKB lens. And for the dynamic window analysis procedures, so our method will dynamically detect window sizes and locations, and it will also automatically control the genome-wide type and error rate. So here, for, uh, so here for, for these strategies, we are mainly focused on to address the challenges uh, uh, of the selection of the rare variants in the variant set. And then after we define the variant set, uh, we, uh, the start pipeline uh, further incorporates multiple functional annotations to, to empower the variant set test using the star frameworks. So here we use a star O test, uh, which is an omnibus test that combines burden, scat, and ACAT V using multiple annotation ways. So there are two advantages for the star O test. First is that by incorporating different tests, so the star O is robust to the sparsities of the causal variants and the directions of the effects. And the second advantage is that so our star O test incorporates multiple functional annotations uh, that predicts uh, the, the different biological functionalities of the variant. So in practice, we recommend you to use our proposed uh, uh, annotation principle com uh, 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 annotation principle components, uh, which represent so the uh, uh, so the multi dimensions of the variant uh, functionalities. By doing so, our star our star O test is powerful when any of these functional annotations can pimp out the causal variants. So here. So here, by doing the star O test, so we are mainly to address the, uh, uh, the, the, the second and the third challenge in the real variant analysis, uh, uh, which is the choice of the variant set and, uh, and also the incorporations of the uh, functor annotations to increase the analysis power. And also our star pipeline is resource efficient for the whole genome rare variant association analysis. Our star pipeline could automatically define the variant set and it and it used the sparse it used the sparse real-time matrix of rare variants to boost the computation speed, and it also used the sparse GRM to reduce the computation burdens of fitting the non-fixed models. So here by by taking the advantage of the sparse structures. Uh, of the genotype matrix of the whole genome sequence studies, our star pipeline solved uh, uh, the computation scalabilities of, for analyzing this huge data set. And our star pipeline could also automatically perform the conditional analysis when the user providing the known variant list. So on the left hand side, it is uh, workflows for the conditional analysis of the single variant. So the user needs to provide a known variant list. Uh, for example, the Jiva signals in the MVP studies. And then first, our star pipeline will first do the stepwise selections to select the independent variant among the list known variant list. And then uh, and then our star pipeline uh, will do the conditional analysis by adjusting on the selected known variants uh, of the significant single variants uh, to, 
uh, to to detect some novel single variants. And on the left hand side, on the left hand side, it is the workflows for the conditional analysis of the real variant sets. So the workflows is very similar at the single variant analysis. The only difference is that so. Uh, so for the conditional analysis of the real variant sets, our SAR pipeline uh, uh, allow you to further uh, to further adjust uh, for the for the significant single variants. So by so by adjusting for this variant, uh, uh, we will uh, it it will help you to uh, to make sure that so the novel real variant set could be only found by the variant set analysis, and the and the conditionally significant findings are not are not driven by the single variants uh, in the variant set. And here is a real data uh, application examples of the star pipeline. We apply the star pipeline to analyze the uh, the total class shows in the top at phase five data. So the sample size is is around the thirty thousands, and the variant number is uh, uh, is about two uh, two hundred and fifty five millions. So we use our star pipeline to perform real variant associated analysis, uh, including the gene centric analysis. Uh, all five coding categories and eight non-coding categories, and also the non-gene centric analysis, including two K, including the two KB standard window procedures, and also the dynamic window analysis procedures. So in this slide, I will show you the gene centric coding analysis result. So on the left hand side, it is a Manhattan plot, and from the Manhattan plot, we we detect the 19 significant coding maps at the genome wide buffer only corrected levels of five times 10 to the minus seven, and all of these findings are are located in the in, in known lipids associated genes. And then we just do the conditional analysis uh, by adjusting for the uh, for the known variants from the GBAS catalog, and we find that so the 16 of these 19 associations remain significant in conditional analysis. So this result just indicate that we detect the novel rare variants in some known lipids associated genes. And on the left hand side, it is a QQ plot, and from the QQ plot, we see that our procedures well control the type and errors. So this slide uh, just shows the gene-centric non-coding analysis result. So due to the time limit, I will not go into the details. But here I want to emphasize that so our SAR pipeline will 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 automatically uh, uh, help you to uh, to uh, to perform the result the summary registrations and the visualizations, uh, uh, including the Mahan plot, QQ plot, and the results. For, uh, 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 under under the result of the un unconditional and conditional analysis, and in this slide is is, is show the selling window analysis result. So similar as before, our star pipeline uh, will will help you to summarize and visualize the analysis result and provide the Manhattan plot, QQ plot, and also the summarizations of the unconditional and conditional analysis. And also and and also it is the same uh, uh, for the dynamic window analysis procedures. Yeah. Now I will leave the floor to to see how and and and, and see how will uh, will talk about the implementations of our star pipelines in RAP. Thanks, Shilin. There's a couple questions for you in the Q and A, so uh, please feel free to go ahead and jump on those. And uh, now uh, we'll have Xi Hao. Uh, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ben, for inviting me. Uh, thanks, Lin, for an introduction to the STAR pipeline method and its application in analyzing Tomat Lipids whole genome sequencing data. And now, given the time limit, I would like to give a very brief overview of the implementation of STAR pipeline based on the UK Biobank RAP on DNA Nexus. So from a RAP user's perspective, we start from the input of genotype covariance and genotype files, followed by data preparation steps and also uh, annot uh, annotate variance steps. And then star pipeline just provide like the single uh, single variant analysis uh, for common variants, and then the variant set analysis for rare variants, as well as the analytical follow-ups. So for the data pre-processing step, there are available methods for calculating ancestry principal components as well as the genetic relatedness matrices, including the fast sparse GRM method developed by Dr. Ronak Day in Professor Shi Honglin's group. GCTA software suite developed by Professor Jian Yang's group, et cetera. So here we want to note that we only need one time compute computation for the PCs and GRMs, for example, for the 200K whole genome sequencing data, which can be further subsetted for the analysis of any phenotypes. 
In terms of generating the GDS files, our collaborator, Dr. Andrew Wu from the University of Exeter Medical School has developed three apps readily available to convert a UK Valbank 200K whole app called whole genome sequencing PCV PVCF files to the GDS files. Note that the PCV PVCF files are split into more than 60,000 chunks with a total file size of hundreds of terabytes. The unique advantage of GDS files is that first, it is a highly compressed format, as we can see in the real benchmarking. For chromosome 17, the generated GDS files has only 8.8 .8 gigabytes to store the gene type information, which has a more than 1,000 times compression ratio compared to the 15 terabytes storage in the PVC format. Furthermore, the GDS files can be further extended to annotated GDS, namely AGDS files, that host both genotype and annotation data at the same place, such that Star Pipeline can make the most of it and analyze whole gene sequencing data in a functionally informed and automatic manner. So uh, here we provide the readily available DNXS app favorite annotator that takes the GDS files as input and automatic annotate data with a wide range of annotations, including the VEP, clean var, numer numerical annotations, for example, annotation principal component, CAD, INSIGHT, et etc., and output the annotated GDS files. More information can be found on the GitHub repo, and this is a joint work with Dr. Fu Feng Zhou from uh, Xi Hong's lab. So this is the uh, STAR pipeline app, which takes the AGDS files as input and performs functionally informed association analysis and output results, and more details can be found on this GitHub repo. And here we provide two readily available DNXS apps, STAR pipeline summary, that takes the association analysis results from STAR pipeline apps as input and performs a little follow-ups, including conditional analysis and querying individual variant functional annotation scores, et cetera. And more details can be found on this uh, GitHub repo. We also provide a uh, comprehensive user manual with command line details for favorite annotators, star pipeline and star pipeline summary apps readily available. And this slide just presents a walkthrough for a typical use case for the analysis of uh, UK Bank whole genome sequencing data. And I think that then could potentially elaborate a little bit more, and I will just save some time. So the take home message of STAR Pipeline is that it provides a general rare event association analysis framework for functionally informed biobank scale whole genome sequencing studies. It boosts rare event association analysis power by dynamically incorporating multiple functional annotations as weights, and it performs powerful and resource efficient computation for biobank scale whole genome sequence studies. And all the aforementioned methods and tools are available as the form of apps on the, on the UKB route. And uh, we would just like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Shi Hong Lin from Harvard and her lab members, Hu Feng Shila and Ronak, as well as Gina Pradeep and Jerry Christen from the uh, Comet, uh, Comet program that Lick is working group, as well as colleagues from uh, University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and University of Exeter Medical School for their material support. And uh, finally, thanks again to Ben for inviting us. Awesome. Thanks, Xiao. Uh, really, and, and a personal thanks uh, for really speeding things up. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit into uh, how to uh, deploy apps on the UKB wrap uh, very specifically. So uh, we'll uh, we'll jump into that in a second, and then we'll have some time uh, for Q and A at the very end. Uh, I'll speak very quickly, so we'll bring all our uh, panelists back on uh, for some live Q and A. But if you do have questions, please put them into the the Q and A box, and uh, Shalin and Rachel. Uh, and hopefully she how in a minute uh, will all be um, they'll all be answering questions there. So uh, that should be great. All right. So next up, uh, really thinking about uh, building these apps onto DNA Nexus. And I'm going to tell you, spoiler alert, that these are already built for you, both the Star Pipeline apps and the Open Cravat apps. So you really can just go to their GitHub repos for DNA Nexus git clone those things, and then just run the dx build command. So that'll be very simple. 
But let me tell you a few things about how DNA Nexus apps are structured, just in case uh, you want to build these yourself. Special thanks to Ted Ladaris and the DNA Nexus documentation team for these slides. All this material uh, you can find on the community, on DNA Nexus documentation, um, and in some of our other webinars going over sort of basic use of DNA Nexus. Uh, again, uh, thanks to Ted um, uh, for providing these slides. So basically, uh, building an applet workflow, you could build it using DX App Wizard, but again, these have already been built for you by uh, the these teams. Now, if you have another annotator uh, that's on GitHub that you'd like to, to put in and there's a pipeline for that, you can use the App Wizard to build IOs. I'll tell you as a pro-level bioinformatician, if you've never built a DNA Nexus app before, the whole process is about two to four hours, but then you can build a DNA Nexus app anytime you want in just a couple of minutes. So uh, just think about that for uh, uh, learning. But again, this skeleton is there for you. Now I've used an example of Sam Tools Count uh, for this. That's the example in our documentation. But really, uh, for this, this would be either Open Cravat or one of the Star Pipeline tools uh, that she how uh, outlined. That's going to be there in their GitHub repo. So all you got to do is get clone it, pull it down, and then you can go ahead and use the DX build command. Uh, when you see this, if you want to modify it, you can go into the Basher Python script that they have wrapped. <coughs> and change inputs, outputs, parameters, whatever you want to do. Uh, really, uh, UKB wrap and DNA Nexus in general is your platform. Uh, finally, uh, you just use the ter term DX build and whatever the uh, name of the root directory is, and that'll give you an applet ID with uh, one exception that I'm going to get into in a minute for the wrap. Uh, so again, here's the basic structure. It can be generated by DX app wizard, but this has been done for you. But there's also this DX app dot JSON. What that does is it outlines the IO for all this. For those of you who've tried the wrap, that's great. And you've seen that there's default inputs, DX outputs, et cetera, et cetera. We will also post the links here. I would ask Rachel and Kyle, uh, as well as Jilin and Jila, Jihao, excuse me, to post the wrap, uh, to post their links uh, in the Q&A. Um, and they will also be posted uh, when uh, we pop up the slides and the recording in community. Thanks, everybody. Okay, great. So uh, here... Um, uh, basically, you have this executable script. I just talked about that. Um, but there's one other thing uh, that must be done uh, to modify this. And I'll talk about that uh, before we get to SNPF. And that is uh, for building the applet on wrap, the one modification is you need to make sure that the dxapp.json file uh, if it doesn't build, it's usually because the regional options need to say AWS EUS2. That's something uh, a lot of people um, need to get, um, need to uh, fix in the DX app.json file. But other than that, everything should run. Uh, Priska asks, is there a GitHub for, uh, tutorial on GitHub for running the star pipeline on RAP? There's definitely a tutorial there for installing it, and it should be relatively self-explanatory uh, to be able to run it uh, also on the things that uh, uh, we discussed earlier. Finally, if, I, I mean, in my opinion, my personal opinion, uh, Open Cravat and the Star Pipeline are really modern annotation platforms. That said, uh, most of the people in this room are bioinformaticians. Obviously, you used SNPF before. The RAP has a pre, uh, really a pre-compiled uh, app for everyone to use uh, for SNPF. So if you need really basic annotations, 
Don't need to do anything modern, just a really rough approximation. Uh, you can grab snip F annotate. Uh, it's already there, already provisioned for you. So I just, I wanted to mention that uh, really for completeness here. So, but I, I personally recommend uh, that you build uh, either open cravat, the star pipeline, uh, really to get, I think the power and, and really the scientific potential uh, out of the uh, really just enormous number of variants uh, that are coming out of UKB rep. Um, there's a great question earlier about uh, thinking about uh, variants in non-coding regions. It's a very hot area of research, a very complex area of research. Um, we don't have much time, but uh, if we have a few minutes, uh, what I'd like to do is just allow uh, either Shalin uh, or, uh, uh, yes, there is a DNA next. Um, I'd like to invite either Shalin uh, or Rachel or both uh, or Shihao, um, all our speakers really, to talk about sort of the emergence of variant annotation in non-coding regions. I'm particularly excited about uh, variant annotation in enhancer and promoter regions, but uh, if um, if you guys would like to respond verbally, please uh, feel free. Well, I can start. Uh, sure. So Open Cravat has, I think we have about 30 uh, non-coding annotators uh, that you can use. And they come, they include uh, experimental data, say from ENCODE. There are some computational predictors, such as Fathom, uh, uh, Linsight, uh, Segway, we have we have a whole collection of these. So I think you can uh, you can find these by looking at our in our README, uh, and you could select these annotators. I think in general, uh, there, the field is just not as advanced in terms of interpreting these as it is for coding variants. Um, I think it's very difficult to interpret them, but uh, I would use the available annotations. And uh, some of them try to include uh, multiple sources, uh, some of the uh, bioinformatic predictors. Uh, and this is probably state of the art right now. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Jalin uh, uh, or Jihau, anything to add to that? Uh, and I appreciate the answer. We'll try to get to a couple more questions. I know we're running a bit over time. Yeah, sure. So for uh, so for analyzing the non-coding rare variant associations, so our star pipeline just uh, to first we have two two strategies. So the first one we we just group the rare variants either based on the uh, based on the functional categories in the G-centric non-coding analysis. In this in this part, we provide so eight different non-coding masks, and others for when we want to analyze in the, uh, the, the rare variants in the intergenic regions, we could use a non-gene-centric analysis where we group the variants based on the positions. Here, you could either use the fixed size silent window analysis or the, or the data all the data adaptive sites and window analysis procedures. And after we define for the each variant set, either in the uh, gene-centric non-coding analysis or the non-gene-centric analysis, you could further incorporate the, 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 the sum of the annotations which to further increase the powers. For example, you could incorporate the annotations represent the conservation scores or represent the, the local diversities or the epigenetic scores to further prioritize the, uh, the functional variants in the various set and to increase the power for your analysis in the non-coding genomes. So for all of these details, you could find uh, in, our, in our STAR pipeline paper recently published in the Nature Methods. Great, thank you. Uh, that's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I know we're running up on time. Uh, so I want to go go ahead and wrap up. Um, but really, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers again. Uh, there were a couple of questions about um, really uh, STAR as well as Open Cravat being uh, publicly available apps on DNA Nexus. Um, and I'd ask that you try them out and you ask about them in the support channels and all that, if this, these are things you're interested in, because really this is how our product teams prioritize things. Also, 
if you have questions uh, about how these apps work, et cetera, et cetera, DNA Nexus in general, um, you can uh, ask those questions to support. And if those questions are really uh, appropriate for the Open Cravat team or for the Star team, we'll go ahead and forward those to them. Uh, but of course, you can always make, uh, you can always uh, put up issues on their GitHub repos uh, to discuss with them directly. So uh, I think we've generally answered most of the questions. We've been able to get into the Q&A uh, a bit too. I want to thank all of the uh, attendees. Uh, really, most of you hung on beyond the hour, and it was a really active uh, Q&A session, uh, which really tells me uh, a lot about uh, the um, uh, the popularity uh, and really the the need for variant annotation uh, on, uh, on the UKB rep. So. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, presenters, producers, uh, including uh, Brenton and Kyle, uh, and um, and then all the attendees uh, for being here. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day, a great rest of the week. Check out community.dnanexus.com or our newsletter for upcoming uh, webinars, roundtables, uh, and happy hours. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, have a great day.